The T-Biz Podcast delivers T-News that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. The T-Biz Podcast and blog connect you directly to experts in the tea labs. Listen as their voices reveal the news, innovations, cultural insights, and consumer trends that most impact the industry. Paired with Tea Journey, a digital magazine for tea enthusiasts, the Tea Biz Portal is a global resource for everyone who loves tea. Hello, everyone. Here are this week's headlines. Maritime security concerns worsen in Suez and in the Red Sea. Rising operating costs close a third of Uganda's tea factories. And hydration concerns are motivating consumer purchases. Plus, the Committee on Sustainability Assessment was established to measure the massive quantity of precise data and the impact of harder-to-quantify pragmatic ways of measuring sustainability, such as living income calculations, gender inclusion, and next-generation training. In 2005, sustainability pioneers at the United Nations identified the need to harmonize sustainability metrics with science-based credibility. Seven years later, CASA became a not-for-profit public research organization to complete that work. Partly financed by the Gates Foundation, CASA has since standardized sustainability metrics for a hundred ag-related information technologies. Newly named CASA CEO Liam Brody joins us on the TBiz podcast to explain CASA's role in intelligence gathering and developing strategic tools that advance sustainable practices with good business underpinnings. He also shares his vision of how artificial intelligence will revolutionize and influence consumer behavior and the perception of sustainable practices. More in a minute, but first, this important message. What makes a perfect cup of Ceylon tea? The perfect cup is from the tea businesses that ensure the protection of all the children living within their tea estates. We salute Keilani Valley, Telawakili, Boga Wanthalawa, Harana, and Elliptia Tea Estates. Support Save the Children, Sri Lanka. Shipping company executives see no sign of improvement for vessels transiting the Red Sea as UK tea companies take steps to avoid shortages. Half of the tea consumed in England is shipped from Kenya and India via the Suez Canal. Executives at Yorkshire Tea and Tetley Tea reassured the public this week that they had implemented measures to minimize any disruption of blending and manufacturing due to shipping delays. Tea imports from outside the EU amounted to about 104 million kilos in 2021. Spokesman Tom Holder of the British Retail Consortium, representing 200 retailers, said delays thus far amount to no more than a, quote, blip. Companies are adjusting orders and inventory to account for 10 or more additional days at sea. Three months into the crisis triggered by the war between Israel and Hamas terrorists, Yemen's Houthi rebels continue their drone and missile attacks in both the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea. Executives of the largest shipping companies told Bloomberg TV that threat levels continue to escalate and that disruptions could last an entire year. Maersk Chief Executive Officer Vincent Clerk told Bloomberg, quote, the amount and range of weapons being used for these attacks is expanding and there is no clear line of sight to when and how the international community will be able to mobilize itself and guarantee safe passage, end quote. More ships are rerouting via the Cape of Good Hope than transiting the Red Sea via the Gulf of Aden. Biz Insight Sharon Hall, Chief Executive of the UK Tea and Infusions Association, reports good stocks of tea currently in hand. 
According to the association, Britons drink about 100 million cups of tea a day. UK blenders also export about 9.5 million kilos of tea, valued at 2 million British pounds. That's about 2.5 million U.S. dollars annually, mainly to the European Union. Uganda's tea sector is in crisis with the closing of nine factories, about a third of the 28 in operation. Excess stocks of lower-quality tea following an aggressive expansion of acreage under tea is holding down prices. Spiking costs for electricity led to the closures. Tea is an important crop supporting 80,000 smallholder families in 17 tea-growing districts in Uganda, each factory that closes jeopardizes the financial welfare of about seven to 10,000 families. Trade Minister David Bahati told the local press that the Prime Minister is personally chairing a cabinet-level committee that has drafted policies that will address requests for immediate subsidies to lower the cost of electricity. Uganda has a low per capita consumption of electricity and one of the highest average unit electricity cost in sub-Sahara. Rural factories pay 3,470 shillings per kilowatt, compared to an average cost of 1,900 shillings per kilowatt in industrial areas. The policy recommendations will then be presented to the House, he said. In addition to immediate subsidies, Dixon Kasuopa, an RM, a member of the parliament representing the Shima municipality, encourage the government to implement policies that will enable Uganda to compete better in the international market. He told New Vision, quote, People pluck the leaves without guidance. That is why Uganda fetches the lowest amount of tea in the region, but not because we do not have fertile soils. We need that policy to improve our quality, he said. Members of Parliament representing tea-growing regions are calling for a bailout like that given sugar producers facing similar high production costs. Tea is the fourth most important agricultural export after coffee, maize, and fish. In the UK, 58% of bottled water users would like to learn more about their hydration needs, and 54% of French adults think drinking fortified water it's an excellent way to boost their mineral and vitamin intake. 60% of millennials, the most of four cohorts, are engaged with functional hydration drinks. According to Mintel International, Generation Z and Generation X follow, each with a 58% engagement rate, with boomers indicating 44% engagement. Female Gen Zs are the biggest users of functional hydration beverages. Consuming beverages fortified with electrolytes, first introduced in the 1960s, is top of mind for all four cohorts. Gen Z drinkers seek protein, while millennials, Gen Z, and boomers want multivitamins. The younger generation wants fat burners, while boomers are seeking omega-3 and glucosamine. 85% of U.S. bottled water drinkers say that staying hydrated keeps them productive at work. 73% of U.K. adults say optimal hydration is important for mental performance. Business Insight Water bottles have become a status symbol, a vital accessory to daily life, writes Synergy. Stanley's Quencher has seen a 275% year-over-year increase in sales and has experienced a 215% increase in its best-selling category, hydration, according to Retail Dive. What you are most likely to find inside those bottles are citrus, summer fruits, and berry flavors, according to Synergy. Next... Arbinda Anantharaman in Bengaluru reports on this week's India Tea News. India Tea News for the week ending February 16, 2024. Assam's Kaziranga Park offers tea tourism option. Kaziranga National Park in Assam is set to offer visitors an immersive tea experience. 
The park saw 326,000 visitors in 2023 and is a popular destination in the Northeast, especially as home to the largest one-horned rhinoceros population. The park is surrounded by tea gardens and communities and has been steadily adding more activities such as safaris and cycling to its offerings. With this new addition, they could well give tea a much needed boost. Other uh, news comes from the South in the Nilgiris, the Save Small Tea Growers Forum, representing 65,000 small tea grower families, has asked for the minimum price of green leaf to be set to 35 rupees a kilo. Current prices hover at 15 rupees a kilo with the cost of production at about 25 rupees. And until the price is fixed, the forum has asked the government to create a corpus to ensure that the farmers are paid a fair price. And in North Bengal, a tea worker has allegedly died of starvation. Down to Earth magazine reported that 58-year-old Dani Oran, who worked at Madhur Tea Garden, Alipurdar, passed away on 2nd February 2024. A fact-finding team visited his home the next day and as per the report, Oran's wife, whom they met, showed signs of extreme starvation. Neighbors confirmed that Dani also had been malnourished. The report offers details of Oran's wife's height, weight, and BMI, which are well below normal. Mother Tea Garden, where they worked, was closed for seven years and reopened in December 2023. And in this period, the Orans had no access to supplies via the public distribution system because the papers needed to be digitized and various government documents needed to be linked in the back end. The couple depended on neighbors for a meal a day. Oran died of seizure and he could not avail medical help as, government, as the garden hospital was not functional and no one around could afford to transport him to the nearest hospital. And now, a word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Nish. I grew up in an organic tea farm and I founded Nepal Tea Collective in 2016. Tea is not just a beverage for me, but a catalyst for social change. Sustainably empowering hardworking artisans like my parents for the past 30 years. I'm on a mission to make the whole world aware of the goodness of Nepali teas and the good that comes from supporting growers in this remarkable land. If you haven't tasted Nepali teas yet, you're missing out. Our award-winning teas are making headlines. Find out why. Visit Nepal Tea Collective's website to get a free sample of this extraordinary taste of the Himalayas. That's nepalteacollective.com. Or just send me an email at nish, N-I-S-H, at nepalteacollective.com. Cheers. The Committee on Sustainability Assessment, COSA, was established to measure the massive quantity of precise data and the impact of harder-to-quantify pragmatic ways of measuring sustainability, such as living income calculations, gender inclusion, and next-generation training. In 2005, sustainability pioneers at the United Nations identified the need to harmonize sustainability metrics with science-based credibility. Seven years later, CASA became a not-for-profit public research organization to complete that work. Danielle Giovannici co-founded CASA to counter what he called, quote, the fluff and ignorance masquerading as development and colossal sums wasted by well-meaning funders, end quote. He championed the democratization of data, end quote, devising standard metrics for the coffee industry in 2018. COSA, financed partly by the Gates Foundation, has standardized sustainability metrics for 100 ag-related information technologies. Giovannucci retired in December, and Liam Brody was named his successor. Brody joins us today on the TBiz podcast to explain COSA's role in intelligence gathering and developing strategic tools that advance sustainable practices with good business underpinnings. He also shares his vision of how artificial intelligence will revolutionize and influence consumer behavior and the perception of sustainability practices. COSA Board Chairman Richard Rogers, in announcing the promotion of Liam Brody to CEO, described him as the right leader to unlock the exponential impact of the organization. Brody, quote, 
As an accomplished and visionary leader who can drive the transformative change needed to help tackle today's sustainability challenges, writes Rogers. Liam was president of Sustainable Harvest, a trailblazing B corporation and leading specialty coffee importer. As president, he doubled the company's size, leading strategy and operations while overseeing sourcing sales, finance, marketing, technology, talent, and impact. Liam spent nearly a decade with impact investing pioneer Root Capital, helping unlock $1 billion in finance for small and growing agricultural businesses around the globe. Earlier, Liam was director of sustainable coffee for Green Mountain Coffee, now Keurig Dr. Pepper, and was a program manager, campaign director, and private sector advisor for the humanitarian organization Oxfam, where he played a crucial role in building the fair trade market. He earned a Bachelor's of Science in Agricultural Education from Cornell and holds a Master's of Education degree in Social Policy from Harvard. Congratulations on your appointment. It's an outstanding choice on COSA's part. Dan, you're one of my um, heroes in the tea and coffee community. I've learned so much from reading and traveling with you over the years. Pleasure to be part of this conversation. And just a sentence or two, will you tell listeners what you will do now that you've got the reins in hand? Been working at the intersection of data and sustainability, uh, you know, really working to transform food and agricultural systems since uh, you know the early 2000s. You know, it started with the question of, well, what do we measure? How do you measure that? <laughs> what do you do when you have the data and you've measured it? And then how do you make sense of it? And we're taking that forward. We're working with really exciting partners to try to, to bridge these gaps that a lot of us that come from tea and coffee and chocolate, uh, you know, we love the craft. We love, you know, the value chain. We love the producers. Uh, we just love everything about this culture. But we might not be as as familiar with uh, you know computer science. We might not be you know as familiar with how to use data. We might not be as familiar with how all of these advances you know could could solve problems that many of us have been wrestling with for decades. And so for me, we're bringing those solutions from COSA to tea to coffee. And, and to so many more industries, uh, so we can be part of building a food and agriculture system in the world that works, that is climate proof, and that is economically friendly for all involved. And you know that used to be pie in the sky, and now with data, new tools, uh, generative AI, and so much more, it, it's a reality knocking on our front door. It used to be that no matter how smart the human was in this equation, we just couldn't process all this data ourselves. Just too many variables, it, you know, old school, forget the new variables coming at us. But now when we start to layer this data together, uh, it's amazing predictability that's around the corner. But here's the thing that's missing for a lot of folks. Where's the system? And, and how are those systems talking? And how do they interrelate so... It's not the, the you know one hypercapitalized set of gardens. It's not the one trader, but they become ubiquitous throughout the industry where growers are feeding data in. And this is allowing us to to play a granular game, like you said, for consumers, for for all of, of these you know variables that we couldn't once you know really cater to, but now we can in a sophisticated way. And, and you know, that that starts to address how, how do you deal with switching with you know suitability for growing with climate and how do you begin to adapt real time? Because these are not harvest over harvest moments. These are day after day moments that you see all of these changes that ultimately affect consumer availability. We spent last year, you know, we're doing a massive project with the Gates Foundation right now that is just a, a joy to be a part of. We are, are figuring out you know, what we're calling lean and agile data. What do we need to do to figure out the most innovative ways light touch ways to be able to measure. And, and you know, a lot of us are, are going back to what we all know. There are tools that a lot of us uh, in uh, especially Western consumer culture 
I get a, a, a text from my doctor. Do you want to confirm that appointment? I get a, um, a phone call from a computer that says, uh, you know, your child didn't make it to school on time today. Why aren't we using those same technologies in ways in supply chains? And so what we're doing now is we're using tools like coded WhatsApp messages where we can meet growers where they are, harness the data live time, real time in the moment and yeah. move it into play quickly. So you don't have to wait till the end of the harvest, just like you're saying, Bill and the team at UC Davis is doing step by step by step. So we don't have to wait for the whole chain to digest that problem and then look backwards and say, what happened? Alan Lay and his team at Profile Print in Singapore and Dr. William Rissenpart, who heads the coffee lab at the University of California, Davis, have each developed cloud-based apps to identify raw and finished leaves, seeds, and grains, IDAAS, as an authentication service that uses desktop sensors, scanners, and even cell phones to upload digital profiles and in seconds download detailed chemical and physical attributes of the sample that reveal and quantify defects, colors, shape, the presence of adulterants, and other characteristics closely correlated to organoleptic qualities assigned by trained tasters. Absolutely. Our, our inability to analyze where something bad happened in, in, in the QA process and we always assume it's earliest in the chain often. And we know that the, the cup was good. Then we have a better sense that, oh, it must be somewhere after that. It's probably whoever bought that. But a lot of the time, the middle is blurry. You know, a lot of us have had friends that have been invested in things like sensors and containers, but, you know, yeah. insufficient yeah. sort of data flowing from that. I, I love the idea of, you know, shortening those those feedback loops. So you can quickly identify handling issues. You can quickly give feedback. And, and frankly, you can quickly course correct, you know, from a market perspective, if something goes sideways and find alternatives. Listen to this. You're a grocer with 100,000 pounds of this stuff inside your warehouse. You throw a sample in the analyzer, and now you know you've got four weeks to sell it before staling becomes such a critical issue that you'll have to discount. So and when, then you integrate you... that into other data models that start to look at <laughs> supply chain risk, that look at political risk or climate risk, that start to yeah. correlate those, and then you yeah. get into the predictability, which is super cool. Oversupply of tea is widespread. It's a cyclical problem that depresses prices over decades. Tea multinationals exerted control over supply because they owned plantations and factories and employed large workforces. Today's markets are fragmented, and there will never be a one-size-fits-all tea. The sellers have unprecedented access to data, however, and those who monitor consumer preferences could order tea on demand. In specialty coffee, Starbucks and Nespresso set quality minimums, then either vet or train growers to meet those standards, rewarding them with long-term contracts at premium prices, and achieving balanced supply and demand for their markets. That's the future. That's absolutely it, Dan. And and here's what I love. I mean, not to not to bring it back, you know, too much on on the sustainability side, but it used to be what we would separate these out. We'd say sustainability it becomes a hurdle for some growers because it was seen in a silo. It was seen a, a, as a, as if it wasn't part of this system. And now what we have the ability to do, if we're collecting the right data at the right time, we can start to understand the correlations between sustainability investments and core business ROI. We can start to see how labor, uh, how biodiversity, how water scarcity, uh, you know, how production fits in live time, real time with pricing, with market demand, you know, with profile changes. If you can start to have access to that data and then make sure that it's not, you know, what the computer scientists say is dark data. It's not just sitting there on a shelf, but moving quick to action and insight for everyone, especially the grower. Like you said at the beginning, we can all be part of starting to understand, you know, what investments to make and when to get that T on demand ultimately to the right market at the right price. And we're starting to see really powerful correlations, but in order to play in that, 
you have to figure out one what you're measuring you have to have places to you know to put that and then you have to have systems that, that work to analyze and visualize and, and allow the the value chain to participate and right now there's not enough of that and you can see and in, in just in your examples the, the the companies that are investing in data and have been for years are now figuring out how to harness it and are are leaping far beyond those that don't have that. If you've just looked at data and measurement of these things from a compliance issue and not a core business performance issue, you've missed out. And the, the window is closing because we know that regulations are changing. We know that consumer demand is predicated upon evidence. And we also know that climate change is changing everything from you know, shifts in growing regions and suitability and yield and quality and past outbreaks, you know, f forget, uh, you know, what that will do to labor shortages and the human rights impacts that, that follow from those things. If we don't have data at the center, we don't get to manage through that, uh, let alone play in certain markets as in coffee, cocoa, beef, you know, palm, et cetera. And, and it's it's coming for, for tea. We all know that it, it's the next wave. And so to be able to get to a point where you can pull those tools together, you can start to have these insights for operators, uh, not for PR, but for operations, core operations. How do I really mitigate risk? How do I build resilience? Uh, how do I meet the market? You know, the way I need it as, as, a, as a trader, as a buyer, as a brand, and as a producer. I think you're right. I mean, COSA sits at that intersection now where maybe 20 years ago, we scratched our heads about why sustainability, or if we did, it was, you know, it's because I care. But now we're starting to be able to trace that back to this is core business. This is about performance performance for farmers, this is about performance for value chains, and this is about measuring what matters most in order to do that. And we all started with this idea of, well, what do you measure? We started to really standardize that across industries. You know, you saw that last week at the, at the FAO, you know, conversation uh, where we're standardizing and normalizing. We, we don't have to guess anymore what these things mean. In some ways, it might be terrifying for some industries to become regulated, but it takes the guesswork out of it. It, it. it means that there is an equal playing field. And now the game is what can you do once you know those things? Because none of us want to spend all of our time, money, and energy on measuring things. <laughs> we don't have enough money for that. And, and a lot of the time we're overlapping measurements in really inefficient ways, but we should be doing collaboratively as a sector and, and not competitively. So we could actually compete on the things that matter put our money into these investments and into, you know, the future and not just looking backwards. And that's the problem. A lot of us have just looked at compliance and backward looking data for so long, rather than looking forward, aligning it all together in models that allow us to be predictive and, and to see how these things complement each other or be honest when they don't and understand there are trade-offs sometimes and start to see those before we're forced to make them or before we have to you know, cover them up with, with some type of stick on the pig, which I think is insulting to lipstick and, and a pig. Days. Collecting rich data is essential to traceability, which in turn is critical for credibility in marketing, right? I couldn't agree more, and, and we're there. The curtain has been pulled back. There's no more hiding, and, and that's exciting because we all know that these are investments that need to be made in our future because if, if we're not making them now, uh, knowing what we know about population shifts, knowing what we know about climate, knowing what we uh, you know, understand about the political risks associated with both, we have to get around those corners. We have to have scenarios that predict what's coming. And, and if you're not dealing with data, if you're not managing these systems, if you're not learning real time, you're missing out. And it, it's it's that plain and simple. But the best is there's a place for people to play. People you know, want to learn. Uh, it makes me so proud to be a part of an organization like COSA because you know, we work to build bridges across governments and, and global brands and farmer organizations and certifiers to really get to that core essential truth. What are we solving for? How are we solving it? And how will we know if we've done it? The data speaks for itself. It, you can't obscure it if you're measuring the right things in the right way and then looking 
to, to better understand performance, whether that's economic performance for a value chain, whether that's social impact performance, environmental performance, or how those tie together. And so for a lot of us, uh, you know, it is a new day and you know, I'm just so excited to be a part of it. Intrigued by what you've heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of T-Biz journalists and tea experts? Remember to visit the T-Biz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week. Produced by Audavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.